All right, cool. Uh, what's up, guys? My name is Nathan Blau. I'm a researcher for Riot Games. I work on the Riot game, uh, League of Legends. Um, so real quick, I can kind of see people. Uh, how many people, uh, raise your hand if you are familiar with League of Legends. Okay, raise your hand if you still play League of Legends. Oh, you guys are hurting me, come on. All right, no worries. All right, so we're gonna be talking a little bit about League. Um, actually a lot about League, so just as a brief reminder for those of you guys who maybe aren't familiar with it, um, League of Legends is a group dating experience where we put 10 people together. Wait, sorry, I read my notes on Sorry. So League of Legends is a competitive uh, 5v5 uh, MOBA, that's multiplayer online battle arena game. People play as champions and they secure objectives, try to win the game, uh, try to get along. Cool. So, we're going to be talking about Runes or Forge, which is the largest gameplay update to League of Legends. Uh, we're going to be talking about the research that went into that, uh, and a lot of our key findings from that. Cool. So to give you guys an overview of what we're going to be talking about, uh, I'll first do just an overview of what the research actually looked like uh, for Runes or Forge, and tell you what Runes or Forge even is. Uh, I'll talk about games as a service and researching major updates. Talk about research analytics and holistic insights. Uh, talking about international labs for a global audience. Uh, competitive testing and pro player labs. And then we'll wrap up with Runes or Forge, what's on the horizon, what's next for that. Cool. So throughout the, uh, throughout the talk, uh, look for these. They'll be our key takeaways. We've put them in a nice red box. Those are going to be the major sort of takeaways for you guys to leave this talk with. And then the other sort of signal you guys can look for uh, is our little research symbol. I'll tell you guys some fun stories from the research that occurred. All right, so let's start with Runes or Forge, um, the research overview. So in League of Legends, uh, again, you play as these champions, but before you ever get into a game, there are a bunch of things that give bonuses to your champions. These were called the Runes and Masteries. So, runes and masteries were basically your pre-game setup. They're your pre-game build for your character. You had 30 runes, you had 30 mastery points, you had four types of runes, you had two different mastery trees, and as you played League of Legends, you level up as a character, um, and with every level, you unlock uh, one more of these. That's actually outside of, that's a metagame system, so not actually in the game of League of Legends, where you also level up. Um, masteries were free. The runes cost a uh, in-game currency called IP or influence points. Runes gave a bunch of raw stats. They gave you your attack damage, your health, etc. Whereas masteries gave you situational bonuses. Uh, basically, hey, if you are in this part of the map, you'll get extra attacks or something like that. And this is what those pages look like. That's a sample rune page with all those different selections. And this is a sample mastery page with uh, two of the three trees selected. So we changed all of that. We did a massive overhaul to this pre-game system for League of Legends. Uh, it was called Runes or Forge. And what we boiled it down to was just two styles, six runes. So instead of the 60 choices in the previous system, you only had six now. Uh, all of the pages were unlocked for, or a full page rather, is unlocked for players as early as level one. The runes were entirely free, did not need any of the in-game economy for it. Uh, and the runes gave a mix of stats and bonuses. And one of the previous pain points for our players is that you could only edit the masteries page, not the runes page, uh, when you were in champion select, right before a game starts. With our new pages, you could do all of that right before the game started. And this is what some of those uh, major rune trees looks like, and this is what a sample runes or forge page looks like. Cool. That's an overview of the product. Let's talk about why it was really big for League of Legends and why it's our biggest gameplay update. So it's massive for our gameplay because this affects every single champion in our game. It affects every single system in our game. It affects how the items work. Uh, it affects everything. And there are around 140 champions in League of Legends, all of them with differing rune pages that they were set up that they used to have. We have now changed all of that. It also had implications for uh, short-term economy for our game. 
players had invested uh, tons of IP into those runes. That IP um, tracks to hours of games played. So we had to think about the short-term economy changes. Are we going to refund players all of that that they put into it? They, you know, some players had unlocked hundreds of runes, had invested hundreds of thousands of IP um, into our game. We had to think about, hey, what's the short-term economy ramifications now that we make all of that free? And there's also long-term economy ramifications. You could purchase champions with IP, um, and that was balanced by players also purchasing runes with IP in the previous system, so unlocking this gameplay content for free, but you know, investing your time and your hours in. Now we're saying, well, you don't have to unlock the runes with that. You don't have to unlock the pregame system. It caused some long-term economy changes. It's a very big change. Today we're actually only going to focus on the gameplay. While a lot of our research efforts focus on all three of those, we're going to only be talking about the gameplay. If you guys will allow me, we're going to do some quick maths uh, for why that's the case. So let's do some math. Um, we're going to talk about a champion in League of Legends. My favorite champion. We're going to talk about Yasuo. So, uh, in League of Legends, champions have abilities. One of Yasuo's abilities is called Steel Tempest. That's what it looks like. It's a light. Cool. Yasuo thrusts out his blade and he damages people. Uh, he can cast it, actually. What happens is he casts it three times. Uh, on the third cast, he sends out a swirling tornado. Looks really cool. He sends some cool lines. It's all fun. Now let's get into the math behind it. All right. Holding up this graph, Yasuo's Q, so this Steel Tempest Q ability, is based, the cooldown of the ability, how frequently you can use it, is based on a complex formula related to his attack speed as a character. So, uh, it can go all the way down to a 1.33 second cooldown, all the way there on the right, that's the lowest cooldown, when he has 111.5 bonus attack speed. All right, raise your hand if you're with me so far. I haven't lost too many. Okay, so now we're going to throw in what we call an attack speed mark, which is one of those previous runes. That grants 1.7% attack speed. You can have nine of those, which brings you to 15.3% attack speed. Then we're going to look at an attack speed quint, which is 4.5% attack speed. You can have three of those, bringing you to 13.5 attack speed. That means your total bonus attack speed from runes is 29%. Who's still with me? Cool, a couple, awesome. Now let's also include the Fury Mastery from the previous system, which gives you 4% attack speed, which means your total from Runes and Masteries is now at 33%. And let's also throw in the first item that Yasuo always builds, which is the Phantom Dancer, and that gives you an additional 45% attack speed, bringing your total to 78% 78 attack speed. Who's still with me? Cool, I haven't lost yet. So now we have to also factor in the attack speed for leveling for Yasuo, which means that around level 14, he'll have an additional 34% attack speed, which brings him to the lowest cooldown for his Q. How many are still with me? Awesome, all right. We're not gonna do this for all 140 champions uh, in League of Legends, but that is to give you guys just a quick taste of how impactful it was to change all of those stats from runes and masteries to the new system of runes or forge. So it required a lot of tuning of all of our champions. <coughs> So we're going to go through now, don't worry, I don't talk that fast about the whole thing, it's just for effect. Uh, we're going to go into the Runes uh, Insights timeline, so this is what our timeline looked like. Throughout the talk, we're not going to adhere to this timeline, this is just to give you guys an idea of what the uh, research process looked like. So we started in Q4 of 2016, uh, this was our ideation research. So this was a lot of initial uh, surveys and discussions with players to identify uh, some of the pain points and opportunities with the previous Runes and Mastery system. In Q1 of 2017, we did our initial uh, testing of sort of our thesis validation build, our sort of first uh, attempt at Runes or Forge with uh, 60 external players, uh, as well as uh, the NALCS organizations. And I'll touch more on that later, but the uh, Quick answer of that is with the Golden State Warriors and the Cleveland Cavaliers. So, yeah. Uh, in Q2 of 2017, 
we uh, did a week of testing in China with Tencent. Um, this was about 40 players. In Q3 of 2017, we did our second round of North American testing, uh, as well as testing with our uh, Korean pro teams from the LCK. In Q4 of 2017, we wrapped up with one final round of testing in China, and then Runes or Forge was on PVE, our public uh, beta environment. And in Q1 of 2018, we had this sort of full official launch, uh, as well as our post-launch work for research. Cool. So that's the general overview of the research, and now I want to talk to you guys about what are some of our key findings from this. What do we want to share to you guys uh, that we learned from this that we think will be valuable for you guys as games user researchers? So. First thing we really want to talk about is games as a service and research for major updates. So, you know, we've heard from speakers uh, from, from Epic working on things like Fortnite. We also heard about Hearthstone previously. We heard about Overwatch. If you look at some of the titles that we have up here, a lot of games are now uh, lasting longer than these sort of games as a service. The idea is, hey, we're not just going to release a game that is then, you know, sort of purchased and consumed for a short period of time. It's, what does a game look like if it lasts for five years? It lasts for 10 years. If, I don't know, in 20 years, I'm teaching my children how to play Yasuo. What does a generational game look like? So, one of our major research takeaways for this is if it's a big sort of investment and if it's a big change that you're doing for one of these games as a service, treat it like it's a new game. So, Runes and Forge was the largest gameplay update we've ever done to League of Legends. Uh, we've done major updates before. We're constantly updating champions in League, but this was sort of like our magnum opus of gameplay updates. So we treated it like we were basically creating a new game. And in a way, this was kind of like League of Legends 2.0. Or, you know, some could even argue 3 or 4 at this point with how much we've updated it. Um, and we actually really believe that games like League of Legends will only survive with these major updates. Uh, it's only by having them be fresh and continuously improving them that these games can stay relevant, that they can still remain uh, fun and top of mind for the players who play them. So the key takeaway here that we really want to drive home is that, hey, if you're doing a big change, if it's a big, in, uh, make it a big investment, um, even as much as a new product. Uh, a lot of these sort of holistic research work that we did for Runes or Forge was comparable to uh, the amount of research work that would be done for launching a AAA game. Because again, we have millions of players already playing this game. It's a major risk to update it in a big way like this. Next thing I want to talk about is embedding to understand the product and the changes that you're working on. So when you're a member of Insights at Riot, and Insights is a mixture of people like me who are researchers, also analysts, uh, we typically Im embed in the broader initiatives that we work on. Those are things like gameplay, esports, publishing, some of these big teams that we work on. For Runes or Forge, we actually went even deeper. Uh, so I actually embedded uh, fully with the Runes team. And the goal of this was to build trust, understanding of the product, and total ownership. This was not me as a research or insights member for Riot. Um, this was me as a member of the Runes or Forge team. So um, if you ask me, you know, during this time last year, what I was at Riot, I would get confused. I, I don't even know if I was necessarily a part of the insights team or if I was a researcher. If anything, I was a developer on Runes or Forge. I was that embedded with the team. So again, what this looked like for us was making sure that I was attending the team's stand-ups, working closely with the designers. I actually sat next to them and would go over all of our findings from playtests. I would build out the protocols for the playtests with the designers, uh, and it was very closely embedded. A step further than that, and this is sort of the key takeaway I want to talk to you guys about, is the importance of mastering the product. Um, and this is something that I think is really valuable for us as researchers. Uh, at Riot, um, some of our researchers and insights kind of get a little bit of flack because it's like, hey, we might not be as like invested in the game or uh, uh, as core of players as some of our designers or playtest team members. Um, mastering your product lets you really connect with players in the lab as well as the designers when you're communicating these findings. 
So what does mastering the product look like? I'm not saying that you need to, you know, you know, drop your job and, and become a pro League of Legends player, but for me it actually meant a lot of nights playing League of Legends and getting better at the game. So, sort of research story here, I have 1,001 nights of League of Legends, and uh, obviously I didn't do 1,001 nights in a year. Not possible, but I actually did play over 1,000 games of solo ranked League of Legends last year. Uh, in my spare time over the weekend, when I was writing up survey questions over the weekend, I'd be playing League, uh, and I actually set out a couple of goals for myself. I said I wanted to play at least 1,000 games, which I did. I also wanted to make it to Diamond League in League of Legends, which I did. Uh, this was coming from someone who was not very good at League of Legends originally. What this allowed me to do, the implications for this, was when I was running uh, some of our research in North America or in China, when players had questions about the system, I was as knowledgeable as our designers. I was able to answer those. I was able to talk back and forth with them. Even today, you can ask me literally about any of the runes in our system now, and I can tell you what slot they're in, what stats and bonuses they give you. I know the system back to back. Another thing that we were actually able to do, though, is just as much as I embedded on the teams, so did those teams embed with the player lab process. So they integrated player labs into development. Now, this is a hard push, I think, for some teams. For some of you guys, it's going to be a lot easier. But what they actually did was the Runes are Forged and built our player labs into their sprints and development cycle. So um, what they would basically do is they would set up when they needed to have a stable build by, what they wanted to have tested in that build, and those acted as major development milestones for the Runes are Forged product. Um, and in a way, it wasn't just good for us from the research perspective that I had clean builds that weren't breaking and causing all sorts of issues, but even for the dev team, they felt like this allowed them to push further and actually gave them meaningful things to ship and deliver. Um, and actually, a lot of our product owners who worked on this uh, project felt like the player labs made them work better. So again, we had periodically stable and complete builds. We had lock-in dates for player feedback uh, for what we want to test with content and features. And we actually were able to even uh, do testing and troubleshooting for some of our international deployment. So key takeaway here is Player Labs not only help to validate like the goals for the product, but they can actually provide structure to dev cycles. So for some of your teams where you guys have an opportunity, that's something you can definitely push for. We all want to talk about research, analytics, and holistic insights. Because this wasn't just a research endeavor of playtesting and player labs. There's a lot of other work that we uh, put into this. So on the note of like player labs and stuff like that, we actually did iterate on what we've historically done at Riot. We started to do it more extended, long-term testing. Uh, and this is something I think that's way more common maybe in the AAA industry. For Riot, this was actually a big deal that we started out with. We wanted to share like some of the benefits we uh, had found from this. Um, so again, we're not launching a new game. We're just doing an update to a game. But our players invest thousands of hours in League of Legends. So researching a, me a major change means that we have to not just test to see if, oh, this is something fun for a day or fun for two days. This has to be fun for their next 1,000 hours. They've already invested so much into this game, we have to make sure we don't kill the spark that put them into that position. So with our North American and Chinese players, we actually tested uh, around 15 full games on Runes or Forge over the course of uh, a month in North America and a week in China. Um, due to having to only have one build in China, they only played on you know, one build, playing all those games over the course of a week. But in North America, uh, we were actually able to iterate based on their feedback. They came in uh, basically every week for four weeks, and we had players come in, play games, we would gather their feedback, we'd make changes to the room system, and then they'd come in the next week, play again. And we found this extended testing to be really helpful um, because, again, we're trying to understand what the next version of League of Legends is going to be, not just, hey, is this this new thing that's going to be exciting for you. Actually, one of the major things that we validated for here, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later, 
was we were able to figure out where we want to tune keystones. Now, keystones are the sort of primary rune uh, that we sort of focused our design around. They're a rune that gives you special combat powers, special healing powers, um, and it's basically the most impactful, strongest thing in the game. Uh, we used these labs to really validate and find out where we wanted to tune that strength. The initial labs in North America actually told us that we weren't making League of Legends, we were making League of Runes or Forge. The game wasn't about our champions anymore, it was really about what are the most powerful runes and which champions have the most synergy with them. So we were able to have a really major impact on the team to let them pull back some of the power on those keystone runes, and that gave them a lot of confidence going forward. So a couple of key takeaways here for you guys. Um, for games as a service, you're, you have to be really careful because you need to not just test the novelty of the change, right? These people are really familiar with your game. Sometimes adding something new might just be exciting because it's new. You need to get that deep exposure. Test for the next 1,000 hours. Don't actually test 1,000 hours, but you know, test to get an idea of are they going to want to play it much longer. And also, in terms of cost for us for research, we actually found doing this extended method to be uh, cheaper in terms of the dollar amount per hours of research. We didn't have to onboard these players as much. We didn't have to go through uh, NDA and secrecy and all of that with them as much. It actually got to the point where they were almost self-sufficient near the end of our testing. They would come into the lab, they'd sit at their computers, they'd boot up the game, and they'd, we literally didn't even have to moderate them. They would just jump right into their games. So as we talk about holistic insights, I will touch on this because we still do have to mention it. I know I said we were only going to cover gameplay, but we actually did have to do a bunch of testing and validation for multiple ecosystems. So as we got closer to the launch of Runes or Forge, the transition plan, what happens to all the players' old runes and all the IP that they spent on the runes, that became really critical to us. So, what we did was we acted in that sense of total ownership that I talked about. Even though I was mostly focused on the gameplay, we still had to address this transition plan. So what that looked like was every time that we brought players into the player labs, even when it wasn't for runes or forge, even when it was for a new champion or a new set of skins that we were developing for the game, every time we brought players in, we'd run them through a 15 to 20 minute exercise that went through the transition plan and we constantly iterated on it. Over the, I think, leading up like two to three months before launch, we actually went through about four or five unique transition plans with players. So what we actually learned from this and probably could have been an even something we could have pushed for harder was how important it is when you're making changes to these big games as services uh, is getting feedback on your messaging and getting feedback on transition plans. How do you implement those changes? The first impressions really matter. We actually had seen this previously in one of our other major changes to the game where we introduced a bunch of jungle plants, uh, these sort of plants into the game that would affect how you play. In all of our regions, except for North America, player sentiment was really high on them. And in North America, we actually had a publishing asset go out that caused a lot of confusion and a lot of anger in our players. And that first impression, it lasted and it mattered. And it wasn't until months after the release of our Jungle Plan update that the North American players actually started to fit in with the rest of the world in terms of their sentiment towards it. So honestly, this was something we probably could have done even more with Runes or Forge. And our quick little research story uh, is, do you have a minute to talk about the Rune economy and your investments? Um, I actually had uh, the privilege of talking to a bunch of economic students um, uh, a couple times actually about Runes or Forge and they, long story short, they stayed after for about an hour, an hour and a half after our normal playtesting time to talk about how what they were studying in economics related to our entire Rune transition. So again, a nice little touch of flavor that you know your players care about this and they'll want to talk to you about it. Some of them won't care about things like economy changes. Others really do value it and will value your investment in talking about it. Finally, when we talk about holistic insight, it's not just the research, it's actually a lot of analytics, right? So the Gameplay Insights team, which I lead, 
is a mixture of researchers and analysts. And a lot of rooms or forge was, like I said, making sure we got the balance correct. So before rooms or forge even went live, we had built out uh, Tableau reports and surveys and all sorts of data so that we could basically capture three important things. Win rate of the runes and champions, the play rate of runes and champions, as well as the satisfaction from players about the rune changes, whether it be the holistic change, a specific rune, or just how their champion felt in the new system. And we built all of those out prior to the launch of the of runes or forge. Um, and yeah, within a few months, we'd actually balanced tons of runes. We've actually totally updated some of those major keystones. We're actually introducing new keystones into the ecosystem. We also did a overhaul of some stat bonuses that the new rune system gives you as well. So building all those things out ahead of time allowed us to actually make changes uh, while we were in PVE, uh, within the first patch after launch, and we're still able to make some of those changes. Some of those we wouldn't have been able to do until months out um, if we hadn't have built those reports early. So again, major takeaway here is prepare your post-launch analytics ahead of time for these changes. Um, players are not going to be as patient with you as they are with a new game. They have a lot of baggage coming into these changes because they have a lot of investment into your game already. They won't have the patience for you to be fixing your game as if, as if it was a new game. They are going to want things changed and you know, basically made comfortable for them very quickly. So next I want to talk about international labs for global audience. So especially for a lot of these uh, games and services, you guys are playing them and bringing them out to players all over the world. So we should be testing all over the world, especially for these changes. So we did that for Runes or Forge. We did international testing for our global audience. Now the thing is you might say, well, that's all great in theory, but how do you go and test these changes across multiple different countries? Well, you be selective with it. We looked at our audience and we actually identified a couple ways to basically get 80% of the value of international testing for just 20% of the investment. So what that looked like for us was testing in North America. What we call that as our developer region. That's where Riot Games Campus is. That's the easiest for our research team to get participants. It's our lowest cost. It's also the easiest in terms of handling translations, etc. We also looked at China and did testing there. It's our largest region. They also have a different interaction with the pregame system. More on that later, but they are both our largest region and the experience that we were changing was the most different for them. Finally, we tested in Korea. It's our most competitive region, and they are also our harshest, uh, harshest critics for any changes we make. A couple of other notes from some other potential areas we looked at. We actually looked at past research. We were considering doing some testing in Europe, uh, specifically Western Europe, but we found that on a lot of our changes, Europe and North American sentiment was very, very similar. Another region we looked at was Brazil, but Brazil actually would almost mirrored North America, but was just more positive. They just liked our changes more, but generally were aligned with the direction of whether they liked it or not. Again, looking at that previous uh, research, we really wanted to look at Korea because they were our harshest critic of change. And China and Korea were similar, but they had some pretty radical differences on some changes, specifically around the pregame system. Hence why we also really want to focus in on China. So key takeaway here for you guys, be deliberate in your international testing, and that way you'll get the most value for your investment when you're doing this research. Let's talk about China. So with China, we actually faced a bunch of UI challenges, and more importantly, we were introducing uh, a new pregame system to one that we actually didn't have experience with before. So, Chinese players had a pregame experience that was different than the rest of the world because Tencent published the game there. It was actually a better experience. They had something called the Tencent Game Platform, which was a way better way of handling the previous runes and mastery system. We also ran into major usability issues in China, partly because we were designing the interface from sort of a Western perspective. Uh, and this is actually one of our major wake-up calls for a lot of our designers on Runes or Forge, 
And they were able to fix a lot of these issues such that when we came back uh, during our round two testing, these issues were fixed. During the first round of testing in China, most of the players couldn't even complete a page because of how the UI was designed. By the time we got to our round two testing, uh, all but one of the players were able to complete a page without any additional moderation. Um, China Labs were also really important because they made us respect the importance of base stats. So again, I, we'll go back to that character Yasuo. Uh, part of our takeaways from that was that base stats were so integral to how characters form and, and, uh, and feel in our game that we had to put in a lot more effort into just tuning a lot of the base stats for our champions that relied on the previous runes and mastery system. And our Chinese players particularly were really sensitive to that. And that might be because the Tencent Games platform gave them more optimized pages. So again, our key takeaway doing uh, some of this was that um, what we wanted to do was like understand that there's regional differences, both in publishing and platform. And how Tencent had developed this system for them previously was very different than what the rest of the world had. Therefore, our research approach to testing our whole new system had to be different. Now we have a really fun story from the labs. I love this one. So it's, what's a girl gamer in China? Uh, there's kind of this uh, like stereotype for uh, in League of Legends for like a lot of our, our girl players where it's like, um, that they only play support champions and they play sort of a more passive style. It's an unfortunate stereotype. One of the really eye-opening moments for me doing research in China was how different gaming culture is there. Uh, so with our Diamond player group in China, and this is Diamond League being some of our best players, um, we had a group playing, so it was 5v5, there were nine guys and there was one girl. And she was playing in the top lane, which is like the I want to tussle and fight lane. She was playing Fiora, which is a duelist champion. And as I talked to the translator, uh, I got some interesting insights. So during the play test, she was yelling and screaming a lot <laughs> at her other at her teammates. And I asked the uh, translator, I was like, okay, so, so what she's saying is like, well, right now she's become the shot caller for the team. So she's leading the team and basically determining what they're doing. I was like, yeah, but, but why does she keep saying like some of those things over and over? He's like, well, those are some very colorful terms that she has for her other players that she is now referring to them by because they're not living up to her expectations. <laughs> um, and I was like, well, I, I've never had this happen before. I mean, they were like actually yelling and screaming at each other. And I was like, I mean, do, do we have to intervene? Do we have to say, oh, no, 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 this is fine. This is what happens in the PC cafes for Diamond you know, play. She's just the one who's like, you know, determined to be the best on the team. So they have to listen to her. And I was like, oh. Okay, so again, this was like a very eye-opening moment of, wow, not only is there culture around maybe toxicity or uh, I guess critical feedback different, but even just the, uh, even just the, uh, you know, the sort of stereotype that we had that, oh yeah, girls play support chains, was very overturned when we did uh, the labs in China. It was a fun takeaway. In Korea, we had Jin Air and Rox Tigers battle it out. So for those of you guys who aren't aware, those are LCK teams. They play in the uh, Korean Pro Tournament. And those are uh, the best teams, in, or some of the best teams in the world. They're not the best teams in Korea, but that means they're better than every team everywhere else. Um, so in Korea, we actually didn't have extensive testing facilities like we had in China. We only have the PC cafes at the right uh, Korean office. But our testing goals for Korea were preserved, right? What we wanted to test there was the game at the highest level of play. Um, we had done a bunch of sort of lower ELO, new player testing in other regions. For Korea, we're like, yeah, we just want to get the understanding of the competitive play. In Korea, that's where most of our players play ranked. Um, it's where esports has some of the most dedicated following. So we wanted to make sure we were getting it right at the highest level of play. So key takeaway there is be flexible with your regional testing plan based on your resources and goals, right? We didn't have the resources in Korea as we had in China. We were still able to fit in the testing with our goals. And we have a wonderful quote, uh, when you play with one system for so long, you get bored. The new system is refreshing. 
Uh, that was a quote that we shared around with a bunch of our team just because it was coming from uh, a Korean superstar League of Legends player. And that was just really good for our designers to get a sense of, hey, the best people at the game who have invested the most time, they appreciate this change. Lastly, I want to talk about competitive play in our Pro Player Labs, so we'll dig into that a little bit further. So Pro Player Labs might be something a little bit more unique to talk to you guys about. So I'll say this, if you are an eSport, if you have intentions of being an eSport, test your changes with pros. It's their game too. So millions of people are probably playing your game, They're probably streaming on Twitch with a few people watching. There are a few people who play your game though with millions of viewers. And these are often going to be your highest level players, your influencers, and oftentimes your pro players. They can provide a very unique perspective on the changes that you're making uh, it's going to be totally different to you as a researcher and towards your development team. That being said, I say use pro players sparingly. Um, they are not there to test UI. They are not there to test cosmetics. One of the major pushbacks we've actually had with a lot of the pro players for League of Legends is they've come in to test things at Riot that they feel are not worth their time because they care about the major impacts to the gameplay, to their livelihood. When we actually went and talked to them about all of the runes or forge testing after we had done it, they said, yes, this is the kind of content we want to come in and be consulted on. So pro players will offer you very unique insight into your games. We'll talk about a couple of those examples in just a second. Um, but also including pros and research fosters goodwill and trust in your community. It shows that you're not just disconnected from your most passionate players. A really sort of interesting thing that we probably didn't listen to our pro players on is there's a rune in our game that's not very exciting. It's called Gathering Storm. It's one of the new ones. And it gives you uh, extra attack damage or ability damage as the game goes on. Not very exciting, right? Well, we actually talked to a couple of pros recently, and it's one of the key things that they talk about in their comms and in their uh, communication while they're in game. To the point that they'll say something like, hey, two of us have Gathering Storm. One person on the other team doesn't have, or only one person on the other team has Gathering Storm. We're going to wait this game out 10 more minutes to get that extra advantage. That's insane that a small rune like that can have that big of an impact such that pro players were waiting games just to get that bonus. And during the start of our season this year, our games were very, very slow and we actually couldn't there were a lot of reasons why, but that was actually one of them that we hadn't quite listened to pro players on as a major reason. We should have listened sooner. Our lab story from this uh, involves two pro players, one playing for CounterLogic Gaming, uh, that's Huhi the mid laner, and for Team Echo Fox, the team owned by Rick Fox, uh, Froggen, who during our testing, they decided to test out one of our uh, new runes that is no longer with us um, for this reason. Uh, and this was back when we were testing what I said, those stronger keystones. So this keystone was called Reap. And what it did was if you got a enemy champion to 20% health, so just 20%, one fifth of their health, it would kill them, just insta-kill them. So they decided to both play the champion Karthus. And the champion Karthus has an ultimate, his ultimate ability, uh, basic, it's called Requiem, it summons these giant pillars of dark energy that damage all of the members of the enemy team, and it brings them, uh, does more damage the more health they're missing. So that, in combination with Reap, caused the most pentakills I've ever seen in the game. Uh, I think it was five over the course of a technically pro League of Legends game. Uh, we removed that rune afterwards. Um, <laughs> Lastly, I want to talk about creating authentic, uh, authentically competitive testing within your normal players as well. So, very early on with Runes or Forge, we actually realized that it was just overall holistically a better experience for more casual players and for newer players of League of Legends. We knew that very early on. The group that we had to win over were our more competitive core players, the people who did all the crazy math to figure out that Yasuo should run all of those runes and masteries. So, what we did was during our extended testing, the testing with the players over the course of a month, we actually created four fun and four glory games. The four fun ones were like, hey, you know what? Try out some new runes, try out some new things in the system, have some fun with it. For glory, we said, no, this is try hard mode. You're playing to win, there will be prizes, 
We actually would give them uh, riot points, which you can spend as in-game currency. We'd give that to the winning teams, and we told them, pick your best champions, pick your optimized rune setup, and play that way. And the idea behind this was we wanted to make sure that the new change wasn't just fun for a casual, you know, quick experience of, oh, this is like a fun and interesting new thing. We wanted to make sure that it was fun at the core of League of Legends, at that competitive level. Um, so what I would say is put extra time and effort into testing that hardest case. When you're designing research for changes, think about who are your players who are going to likely be most affected by these changes, who might be the most adverse to them. Do your extra due diligence with them, do extra testing with them. Uh, also, we did give everyone the rewards at the end of the whole thing, so it wasn't just like the good players only got it, so we kind of tricked them that way, but you know. Cool. So what's next for Runes or Forge? What's next for us on the horizon? So like I said, um, the product went over really well, actually. Um, the vast majority of our players largely prefer this new system to the old. We've been praised actually a lot for it. Um, but we're not, done for, we're not done with it yet. We're actually not comfortable with it. We still have a lot of work that we want to do. Um, there's a couple hard talks that we had to have. We actually think that we didn't accurately figure out some of our publishing in China fast enough, which hurt some of our day one reception there. Uh, there's actually a whole class of champions that we felt were underserved in the new system. Those are the bruiser champions, our fighters, uh, who typically play top lane. That's a very passionate uh, group of our player base. Um, so we still have work to do. We still have to figure out some of those things. What's nice is with this new system not being tied to our economy, with building out the tech that our designers built for it, it makes it way easier for us to balance the system, to swap in runes. We've actually already updated two, no, three of our keystones with one of the updates on the way, and we're already adding in two new keystones to the system. So we're not done yet, but we're pretty excited for it. And what it leaves us with is this beautiful page. This is my Yasuo page, nowadays. Uh, the keystone that I run is Conqueror, and that's actually a new keystone that will be live to players on Wednesday. Um, and that was actually the keystone that we developed specifically for those bruisers, for those fighter champions that were underserved. Um, and yeah, while this page might not have all of the crazy math as those previous Yasuo pages, it has some things that feel really good for players of those champions. We have things like Triumph, right, which gives you additional health and gold when you get a takedown, a killer and assist. We have things like Legend Alacrity, which gives you some of that juicy attack speed that Yasuo loves. We have things like Sudden Impact, which means every time you do a dash, you get additional armor or magic penetration. Things that Yasuo players love, and at the end of the day, we do this for our players, and we're gonna keep doing major changes to League of Legends. This isn't going to be our only major gameplay change. We're going to do more, and we're gonna to continue to do major research alongside it. When you guys update your games, do the same. Thanks. So, uh, also for Q&A, uh, I'll just briefly say, uh, any questions about the Rooms Reforged research, or if you guys have any questions about research at Riot for the gameplay of League of Legends, uh, I can maybe speak to that, or I will ignore the question. So, feel free. I'll let you know why I ignore the question, though. I'll just ignore it. I actually have uh, uh, two questions. Um, so when you did the playtesting with the players in different regions, um, uh, how did you collect the feedback? Like, did you have um, a survey afterwards, or did you have interviews? So we actually had a uh, in-lab survey that was already localized for the different regions. Um, for, uh, specific to China, we actually had uh, moderators from Tencent who moderated the group discussion, and then we actually uh, had those all transcribed, the entirety of the group discussion transcribed. Uh, and then also the Tencent researchers, who were also fluent in English, would then sync with me afterwards and talk to me about some of their key takeaways. Um, in Korea, we had more one-on-one -on -one chats where I would have a translator uh, talking uh, between me and one of the uh, pro players. Um, and then I had a, a more personal question. 
Were you a league player before you started working at Riot? Um, that's a really funny uh, question for some of the people in the audience. Actually, uh, I was an intern at Sony PlayStation, and I didn't really play much league, but a couple of the guys at PlayStation played league and got me to start playing it, and then I like fell in love with League of Legends as a result of it. Um, so, yeah, I actually wasn't that big into it, um, and it wasn't until uh, I actually got to Riot that I became like, uh, for lack of a better word, a try-hard edgelord Yasuo. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Um, so, for some of your testing in Korea, you tested with uh, pro teams, right? Yeah. So, uh, I know that for like Magic the Gathering, other competitive game, um, if you are, if you do get into the point where you're like dealing with what is coming up, but they can, like an upcoming system or an upcoming set of cards. You're like disqualified for X months from competing in like pro tour competitions because of like some sort of concern over getting an unfair advantage. Do you ever have to deal with that? Testing an upcoming feature with some group that might prospectively be competing for money? Uh, no, that's a really good question. So the way we actually handled that was we extended the invites to the entire leagues to go and do the testing. And the other thing is, when we do things way closer to launch, we would have to be more careful of that, but because we actually did a lot of this testing super early on when we were still changing a lot of these things, um, we don't have to worry about that concern as much because the landscape of the changes uh, will necessarily change so much. Yeah, one of the ways we get around that is we make sure we at least extend the invitation to a lot of the pro organizations. And we're pretty open with them about these. Thanks. Hi, uh, I have two questions. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to thank you and your team for reading new life into a game that I love so much. Uh, so, first question, uh, you tested for both uh, users and pro players for League of Legends. Have you working so closely to the design team, uh, you might have more insight on this, but um, how do you reconcile uh, design choices when you have two seemingly separate audiences uh, to account for? Uh, <laughs> I can answer that, but probably come find me afterwards. Uh, Greg Street has an entire GDC talk on just that topic. So <laughs> it's a very long topic, but the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, and my second question. Um, so I'm familiar with the rune pages and the rune systems, and uh, one of the purposes of the redesign you said earlier was to simplify the system for newer users and older users alike. Uh, one of the things I noticed though is that the number of rune pages that players have starts at one and you need to buy additional ones. Um, why was that left in whereas the rest of the system was redesigned? Um, that's actually an interesting question. And I know I start off with that's an interesting question because it sounds like I'm not going to answer it, but um, <laughs> there's actually a fundamental design change with how you edit the rune pages. So if you think of the pregame system holistically, you needed a bunch of different rune pages before going into champion select in the previous system. In the new system, you actually only need one page, and when you're in champ select, it doesn't matter what champion you pick, whether it's a magic damage champion, a mage, a marksman, a tank, you can edit the rune page to fit them, and there's like always enough time within champ select to do so. Um, if anything, it's like you don't need the extra pages in the new system. Um, but yeah, it is sort of still a legacy thing, and I think I think we have discussed like what's a world like where we just open up that whole system and make them all free. Um, because honestly, yeah, it actually doesn't. You're right that it doesn't matter, but it's because it now just works in the new system easier. Thank you. Yep. Hi, my question is about how uh, your working on this project uh, affected the insights on, pro on projects across the whole company. Because um, this was a over a year long process of iterating on the room changes, and obviously that was, that's not the only change that that Riot made within that year. Uh, for example, I know that my my brother uh, play tested for Swain. Um, and was given the room page without any ex of the new room system without any explanation. So, how did you communicate with other project teams uh, as to whether or not you were going to use the system and 
in what stage? Um, I both love and hate that question. Um, I love that question because it's a great question. I hate that question because it brings back the memories of all of how our designers have built out the builds for League of Legends was at a certain point, everything switched over to the new system. So when we brought, this actually was a bit of a difficulty, but all of our testing for anything in League of Legends eventually had to use the new runes before they were announced, before players were familiar with them. So yeah, for things like during the early days of Swain or for the new champion Zoe, people would come into the lab, there'd be a new champion, and I would have to just be like, oh, by the way, your runes and masteries are gone, there's a new system, just ignore it, click this one, let's go. Um, but yeah, basically we actually had to develop a very quick little mini protocol just to introduce them to the fact that all these things were going to be changed when they got into this new system. To be honest, it's not something new, it's not that new for us. Basically, any time I've had to do testing with stuff on League of Legends, we have any number of new skins, new items, um, random champions that walk around the jungle and attack you, uh, which was something we tried at one point. There's, there was a lot of stuff that sometimes goes on in our dev builds, and we have a couple of ways of making sure our players uh, uh, politely ignore it, so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I know that one of the major things that you guys worked on during this Rune Reforge process was trying to influence meaningful player choice in these runes. Um, and I also know, returning back to your example of Yasuo, you know, there's obviously runes that aren't optimal for that. So how do you design your research to take into effect these exceptions? Something like you know, Yasuo not being useful with CDR, and there are runes that give CDR and things like that. Um, there's two points on that. There's the how do we measure it, and then how do we take it into account? The first one, uh, our designers actually do really well, which is some, they've introduced a lot of systems called adaptive uh, systems, which means that you can take this rune and it will say, hey, I'm going to throw a comment at someone that will do adaptive damage. What that means is if you build magic damage, it will do magic damage. If you build uh, physical damage, it will do physical damage. So it doesn't matter if you're a mage or a um, marksman who takes it, right? The other thing is, like, we actually accept that there's a lot of stuff that champions won't take. There are champions that are way more flexible by the nature of their kit, where they can probably take a keystone in every single one of the major trees. There's other champions that will probably only find one or two keystones that are really good. The broader question that you're asking is, how do we actually even measure that, like, goal of increasing choice relative to the previous system? There's sort of two ways we're doing that. One is we actually, you know, literally just do a sort of ask, like a before and after ask, where we've asked how much choice do you feel like you have in the Runes and Mastery system, ask similar questions to that afterwards. Uh, and then we're actually trying to actually develop a way to compare the apple and orange, that is Runes or Forge versus Runes and Masteries, to figure out how much diversity exists in those two systems, uh, in the pre-state and the post-state. Awesome, thank you. Yep. Uh, hey, thank you for a very extensive and uh, entertaining uh, presentation. Uh, I know you touched this uh, topic briefly in your presentation, so it was about the longitudinal studies. Uh, can you add any color to any longitudinal studies, uh, practices and cycles you employ for players that are past their honeymoon or novelty phase? So they are kind of accelerating into uh, getting more invested. Um. Yeah, can you, can you repeat the, the specific question? Sorry. Yeah, how, uh, how do you test longitudinally players that are past, for example, day 15, 30, or something like that? Yeah, so one of the ways we actually just had players uh, that we had that commitment with up front that they were going to do a longitudinal play test with us. Um, as for the types of players we looked at, we have a bunch of data with how we pull our players in that we can screen ahead of time. So we actually did groups of, hey, this person is what we would call like a ranked engagement player, right? They're really in their core of League of Legends, they're playing a bunch. We also have our like, our burnout players who are like, yeah, this guy used to play a bunch of ranks, now he's churned out of the game and he maybe only plays occasionally with friends. We could target those different groups based on their experience levels, and we brought in different groups in. So we actually had more segmentation in the lab than what I presented there, but that's sort of how we did that. Thank you. Yep. When you uh, implemented this update, when you implemented this update, were you conscious of the impact it would have in decreasing cognitive load among newer players or perhaps among 
coming in with diverse players? Was that something that you were aware of, or was that a happy accident? Um, it was actually something we were pretty aware of from uh, internal testing, actually. So we had a bunch of people obviously joining Riot, and a lot of people who come to Riot nowadays don't have as much experience with League of Legends. And from a lot of our playtests with people who are new to the game, the overwhelming answer was, this is a simpler system, this is an easier system, I get this a lot more. Because it's a lot more of these sort of situational bonuses of, oh, if I move this way, if I attack in the river, this obvious thing, I do extra damage, and not these weird esoteric mathematical comp you know, computations that were in the previous system. So actually it was from our own internal testing that we were really validated that this was a better system for new players. Fair enough, thank you. Cool, and... Uh, out of time. Out of time, sorry guys. Uh, oh. 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 Just I know you had a hard hitting question, I'm sure. Yeah, hit me up afterwards. <laughs> guys, thank you so much, I really appreciate it.